In this video, we're going to take a look at section 9.2 on testing a claim about two means. So we will be using the hypothesis testing process. So let's review the components of that process. First, we will identify the claim and write it mathematically. Second, we will identify the null and the alternative hypotheses. Third, identify alpha and whether the test will be a left tail, right tail, or two tail test. Then we will calculate the test statistic. After that, we'll find the critical value and or the p-value, and we'll use those two things, the test statistic and either the critical value or the p-value, to draw our initial conclusion to either reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And then we will state a final conclusion about the claim itself. You should recognize this process because it's the same process we have used for the last several sections. Um, so we've done this for testing a claim about a proportion, about a mean, um, about standard deviation. I didn't actually do that this semester, but hopefully I'll be able to reincorporate that into my uh, curriculum next time. And you would do the same thing with that material as well. The details change, but the process, the structure stays the same for all of these problems. All right, the requirements for testing claims about two population means. The population standard deviations from both populations are unknown and no assumption is made that they are equal. This enables us to use the t-distribution. Um, if we know the population standard deviations, then we should use the normal distribution, but it's pretty rare that you would know the population standard deviations but not know anything about the population means. Um, also, if we assume that the standard deviations might be equal to each other, that leads to a different process that you would want to use in that case. So we are going to assume we don't know the population standard deviations, and we're not going to assume that they might be equal to each other. The two samples are independent from each other, right? because we're getting a sample from two different populations. Those samples need to be independent. <coughs> Excuse me. Both samples are simple random samples, and either or both of these conditions are satisfied. The two sample sizes are both greater than 30, or both samples come from populations that have a normal distribution. So we've seen that requirement on previous uh, material, right? Whenever we're dealing with the mean, in order for the central limit theorem to be valid, which is what kind of enables us to, you know, the, it, it's what it kind of enables the math that we're doing here either the sample size needs to be large enough, which generally the rule of thumb is bigger than 30, or uh, the original population has to have a normal distribution, in which case the sample size isn't really relevant at that point. I mean, it's relevant. I probably shouldn't say that, but not to the requirements, right? So if your original population has a normal distribution, then it's okay if your sample size is 15. Now that does affect the calculations, right? That's going to affect the test statistic. That's going to affect the conclusion that we draw. So it's still relevant, but it still satisfies the requirements for being able to use the process that we're about to use. All right. Here is the test statistic for testing a claim about two means. T equals X bar one or X one bar. I think that sounds better actually minus X two bar. Those are the sample means from our two different samples. Subtract those minus mu1 minus mu2. Now we saw a very similar setup to this in the previous section, 9.1, with proportions. And in that particular uh, section, the difference in the population proportions always equaled zero. The same thing's going to happen with these means. In the course of going through the hypothesis testing, we will set up a null hypothesis, and then we will assume that null hypothesis is true. And that null hypothesis will always be that mu1 equals mu2. And so um, if mu1 is equal to mu2, and that's what we assume to be the case, then when you subtract them, they would equal zero, right? Um, so if we assume these two things are equal, when you subtract two numbers that are the same, the answer will be zero. All right, and that's gonna happen in this section as well. So while this is officially part of the formula that we're using, this will always equal zero, and so many students just kind of drop it or ignore it. 
over the square root of S1 squared over N1. That's the sample standard deviation from the first population sample over N1, which is the sample size of the first population sample, plus S2 squared over N2. And I'm sorry, I really didn't like this formatting that these numbers are like the same size. It just looks kind of weird, but I kind of feel like the subscript should be smaller font sizes, but they, the website I was using didn't do that. So it looks kind of weird, but S2 squared over N2, sample standard deviation from the second population sample over the sample size of the second population sample. All right. And that's gonna give us a T-score that we can then compare to the critical value or use to find a p-value, which we would then compare to alpha to draw our conclusion. All right, so that detail's different about the hypothesis testing. It's different from the previous sections. But I would argue this formula is friendlier, easier to use than what we had in 9.1. That was a really difficult formula that we had there. Now, because we're using the t-distribution, we have to have a degree of freedom and there are more sophisticated ways of determining the degree of freedom when you're dealing with two samples from two different populations. But we are going to stick with something. Um, I'm sorry. I hate when I do that. We're, we're going to stick with something. I'm, my, my southern dialect keeps slipping in. We are going to do something simple here. We're going to try to keep it simple. That's what I wanted to say. The degree of freedom will just be the smaller of n1 minus 1 or n2 minus 1. So this would be like the degree of freedom of just the first sample. This would be the degree of freedom of just the second sample. So for the degree of freedom for the whole entire process, we'll just take the smaller of those two degrees of freedom as the degree of freedom for the hypothesis testing. All right. All right. We will also be asked to find confidence intervals for these scenarios. So here's the formula for constructing the confidence interval for the difference of two population means. So I apologize that uh, I forgot to change that out. I've made this mistake a lot of times in the last couple of chapters. So I apologize. And, you know, part of it, you know, part of it is me. I'm, you know, I'm in a hurry trying to get things done by a certain time because I'm really, I'm doing this video right at the last second, right before my students should be watching it. Um, so I've been in kind of a hurry, but also the other issue is copy and paste, which is more of an issue because of the similarities between these sections. So as I've mentioned over and over, the structure of these problems is identical. And so 8.2, 8.3, 8.4, 9.1, 9.2, 9 they're all doing the same things. Just all I have to do is switch out the details, but the the my lessons really have the same exact format for all of those sections. I just copy the previous one, switch out the formulas, and then I keep forgetting to change the titles on some of these screens. but. That's why it's been so noticeable lately because with the material previously in the course, it wasn't, you know, one section wasn't as, you know, there wasn't as much similarity between sections as there is for chapter eight and nine. Anyways, I need to stop making excuses. All right. So you take the sample version of the thing you're trying to estimate. So we're trying to estimate the difference in the population means. So we take a difference in the sample means minus a margin of error. And then the difference in the sample means plus a margin of error to get our lower estimate and our upper estimate. The margin of error formula is given here. So E equals T sub alpha divided by two, that's our critical value, times the square root of S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over N2. All right, so we're gonna do some examples and you'll see how all of that comes together. Okay, so, with this example, I was copying it from somebody else's lesson plans, and it was a pretty verbose problem, so I thought, oh, I'll just kind of cut out the first paragraph. And that was kind of a mistake because it kind of just drops you right into something and you're just like, what's going on? Subjects with a red background were asked to think of creative uses for a brick. Other subjects with a blue background were given the same task. I'm pretty sure there was a paragraph before that. What they're trying to uh, test for here is do your surroundings affect your creativity? And so just a very simple test. Some people are placed in a setting with a red background, like maybe the walls are all red. And some subjects are placed in a setting with a blue background. So imagine all the walls being blue. 
And then they're given a task and they're going to be measured on the, their creativity regarding that task. And then compared, how did people do with the red background coming up with creative uses for a brick versus people with a blue background? Um, so responses were given, and I think this should be not by, but to. The responses were given to a panel of judges to judge the creativity of the responses. And they were given a score. So much like you can think of like the Olympics, like the, you know, the gymnastic stuff, right? So these maybe three or five judges on the panel assign it a score of, you know, one for least creative, five for most creative, something like that. Researchers make the claim that blue enhances performances on a creative task. Test this claim using a 0.01 significance level. All right, so there's our value for alpha. Blue enhances performances on a creative test. So this is an interesting claim because it's not literal. It's not, it's not written out in literal mathematics. We have to do an inference here. Like, what does it mean for blue to enhance performance? What does that mean mathematically? And then we take the mathematical meaning of that and make that our claim, which we'll get to in just a second. But let's take a look at the data, right? So here are the people with red backgrounds. There was 35 altogether. That's the sample size of just the red background. The mean score of people with a red background, the mean creativity score was 3.39. I don't know. I kind of assume, you know, because I knew what these numbers were about to be, that maybe it's on a scale of one to five, but that information isn't really provided, right? So 3.39 was their average creativity if they had a red background. That sample group had a standard deviation of 0.97. Right. For the blue background, uh, I want to say students, but it doesn't say students here. It says subjects. Okay, that's what I should say. For the subjects with a blue background, there was 36 subjects altogether. Their average creativity score was 3.97. So they had a higher average creativity score than the red group. And their standard deviation was smaller, so there was less variation there. Uh, 0.63. All right. So now <clears throat> I actually covered this example in class just a couple days ago, or maybe it was just yesterday, actually. Oh, just so much is happening so quickly. It's hard to keep track of the time. Um, and I made a decision here, which I'm, I'm not really sure the best way to do this. Um, given this table, the red group is mentioned first. So I decided to make them population number one. The blue group is mentioned second, so I made them population number two. But then it, it makes um, interpreting the claim a little bit more challenging given this choice. So I'm gonna go ahead and stick with it, but it, it might be a little easier going if you actually switched it around and have the blue group be your first population and the red group be your second population. So the claim, remember, in words was that blue enhances creativity. I'm, I'm really paraphrasing and abbreviating here, but subjects with the blue background have better creativity ratings, right? Um, and so if that's true, then the subjects with a blue background should have an, a higher average creativity rating than subjects with the red background. And so, so the way this is worded is kind of in reference to blue, like should blue be bigger or should blue be smaller? But if I'm going to let the red background subjects be population number one, my claim really has to kind of be stated relative to the red background group. So if blue is enhancing creativity, that means the red group should have a lower creativity score on average than the blue group. So the, the mean of the first group, which is the red group, would have an average creativity score lower than the mean of the blue group. If blue is enhancing creativity, the red group's average should be lower than the blue group's average. That's the quickest, easiest way I can think to say that. Again, if you switch these and have blue be number one, then it would be that you know if blue enhances creativity, the average of blue should be bigger than the average of red. And then you would have mu1 is greater than mu2. But then all of our calculations would get switched around uh, from what we're going to be doing now. So, but again, that would be another valid path to take is 
let the blue group be one and the red group be two. So you, again, you might consider that as an option as, as you're going through the homework, which don't you don't have to automatically accept the first one is one and the second one is two um, based on the order the information is given in. It's your choice. You can decide whichever one is population one, whichever one is population two. That's up to you. So make a choice that makes things easier for yourself. And I'm what I'm saying is the choice I've made maybe wasn't the best choice. It might have been easier for us if we had done it the other way, but I'm just going to stick with this. All right. So that's the first step in the hypothesis testing process. Step two, uh, null and alternative hypothesis. So remember, this works exactly the same as it has in every section we've done before this one. The claim has to become one of these. The null has to contain equality. Well, this doesn't have equals to, so it must become the alternative then. So the alternative hypothesis would be that mu1 is less than mu2. Right. And then these have to be opposites of each other. So the opposite of less than is greater than or equal to. All right. And so that would be our null and our alternative hypothesis. However, we want to simplify this, as is the new way of doing things. And we do that by taking the null and just simplifying it to equals two. So mu1 equals mu2 is ultimately what I'm going to have for my null hypothesis. The alternative doesn't change. It stays whatever it already was. Right? So this is the answer you want to pick on my stat lab. Okay, step three is identify alpha. That was given on the previous screen. It's 0 0.01. And whether it's a left tail, right tail, or two tail test, the shortcut for figuring that out is to look at the alternative hypothesis. It's a less than, which means this is a left tail test. Good. Step four, a test statistic. So in this case, it's a t-score. We'll have x1 bar minus x2 bar minus mu1 minus mu2 over the square root of s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. All right, so there's our formula. And all of these numbers are given to us in this chart, with the exception of mu1 and mu2, but we already talked about how that's going to get handled, right? So we're going to assume the null hypothesis is true, like we always do for hypothesis testing, for the sake of argument. Assume that's true. Well, if mu1 is equal to mu2, then when I subtract them, the answer is just going to be 0. Everything else is in this chart. n1 is 35. The sample mean for a group number 1 is 3.39, so that's x1 bar. And the standard deviation for group number 1 is 0.97, that's s1. Uh, there's 36 subjects in the blue group, that's n2. Their average was 3.97, that's x2 bar, and their standard deviation was 0.63, that's their standard deviation, so that's s2. And we just plug all those numbers into uh, this formula. So we're going to have t equals x1 bar, which is 3.39, minus x2 bar, which is 3.97 minus zero, and I'm just putting that there for emphasis that we acknowledge this part of the formula, it's just equal to zero. But when I go to plug this into my calculator, I will not put zero in my calculator, over the square root of S1, which is 0.97, squared over N1, which is 35, plus S2 squared, that's going to be 0.63 squared, over 36. And that's my test statistic. So I just have to plug that into my calculator. Now I had a TI-84 that I had been using for the, you know, the entire duration of me teaching this class and recording all these videos. Um, but it's the last week of class and a couple of my students didn't really have a calculator to do like the inverse norm and the stuff from chapter 10, which is like the linear regression, linear correlation, all that stuff. So I let them, I had two calculators, two TI-84s. I don't know why I'm talking funny. Two TI-84s. I let them borrow those. So now I'm, I'm taking home the TI-Inspire, which 
is difficult, you know, it's kind of difficult to use. So this might take me a second is what I'm trying to warn you about here. So um, let's see, I need to do a calculation. So calculator, okay. So it wasn't, didn't take as long as I thought it would. Okay, so 3.39, put this in parentheses because it's in the numerator, minus 3.97, close the parentheses. I don't put the zero, I'm skipping the zero part, divided by the square root of 0.97 to the second power, all right, divided by, uh, let's see, okay, I'm gonna have to use an arrow here, divided by 35 plus 0.63 squared, use the arrow, divided by 36, close the parentheses, uh, no, I didn't like that, okay, um, all right, uh oh, let's see, I seem, I don't know, I don't know if I have, so I don't, I don't want to show you guys because it might be hard to see on the camera, but the square root symbol stops at 0.63 squared. It doesn't cover the 36. So I'm just kind of worried that it's not that I'm outside the square root with my divided by 36. So let me, let me try this one more time. Let me go here. Okay. Now divided by, okay. Now it's a okay, good thing I did that because I thought, oh, maybe it's fine, but actually I, I, put my cursor back into the square root and typed the di divided by 36 and it covered it this time. So it would have done the wrong thing if I hadn't fixed it. All right. And so I hit enter. Okay. And it actually like formats it pretty nicely. So I can tell that is exactly what I wanted it to calculate. So this should be right. You get negative 2.9790 if you go four decimal places. All right. So that is the test statistic. Sorry, that took me a little bit longer to calculate. And that's going to be my excuse for the rest of the video for all the other calculations that we're going to have to do. All right. Now, step five is to find the critical value and or the p-value. And we say and or because you really only need one of these. But some problems will ask you to find both. So sometimes you're going to have to do both critical value and p-value. But if they don't specifically ask for both of those, you don't need both of them to draw your conclusion. You can, you just need one of these to get to step six, All right? But I'm gonna go ahead and do both anyways, even though I don't really need both because I'm not typing this into my, uh, my stat lab, right? I'm not doing a homework problem or anything, but um, I'm just, I'm gonna go ahead and do both anyway so you can just see how, how both are done. And I don't know why I'm explaining all that. This is the, you know, fifth section in a row where we've done this calculation over and over and over. And I didn't explain it before, so I don't know why I'm explaining that now. But um, I'm going to go ahead and do both. All right. So to find the critical value, you take the alpha and you decide where it should be placed. Um, and that's determined by whether it's a left tail, right tail or two tail test. So this is a left tail test. So all of the alpha goes into the left tail of the T distribution. Remember, we're doing T here. Um, okay, right there. So we don't have to divide it by two because we don't have to cover the right tail. We only need to cover the left tail. And we want to find the t-score that corresponds to that area. And we will do that by using inverse t. The area to the left is 0 0.01. But remember, for the t-distribution, we need a degree of freedom. So the degree of freedom in this case is the smaller of the two degrees of freedom. Um, so I'm trying to think where I should do this calculation. Now. Let's go back up here. So the degree of freedom for the first sample, the sample size is 35. So the degree of freedom for that sample alone would be n minus one, which would be 35 minus one, which is 34. That's for the first group. For the second group, the degree of freedom would be again, n minus one. In this case, that's 36 minus one, which is 35. And I'm going to take the smaller of the two for my degree of freedom for the hypothesis testing. So I want the smaller number, which is going to be 34. That will be my degree of freedom for the rest of this problem, right? So that's how we'll figure out the degree of freedom. Uh, whoops, I erased. I didn't mean to do that. I meant to scroll back down. Okay. And so the degree of freedom is 34. So we type this into our calculator again, 
forgive me because this might take me a second to figure out how to get back. So, I don't know. I guess the easiest thing to do here would just be create a new tab. Okay, so now I want to do menu, statistics, uh, distribution, um, inverse T, it's inverse normal. Okay, oh, there it is. Oh, I thought, oh, it's not here, but I found it eventually. Okay, so 0.01. I don't know why I said found it eventually. <laughs> uh, degree of freedom, 34. Whoops. Okay, okay. And I'm going to get, oh, it doesn't work that way. Okay, so I, I told my student that if you highlight it, you could see the rest of the numbers, but you can't. So another limitation of this is it's it's like a spreadsheet. I'll just show you this one real quick. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, um, the, the calculation's in that first cell, but it's such a narrow width that I can only see 2.4, negative 2.4, um, and that's it. And there's more to it, which is indicated by, let's try that again, which is indicated by the fact that, you know, it has dot, dot, dot after it, but I don't know what the rest of those numbers are. And... I'm not sure. And I thought maybe if you look down at the bottom, it would show you the numbers, but it doesn't. Um, so I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. Okay. No, that doesn't help. Enter. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't tell me. I can't get the number more accurately than that. So I think I'm just going to have to go with it because, you know, I, uh, I don't have time to try to figure out. There is a way to change the cell widths but it's somewhere in the settings and I'm not sure where it is. So I think I'm just going to leave it at that. I would normally keep two or three more decimal places here, but I think this will be fine. All right. Um, so this will be my critical value. There's only one this time for the P value. And again, I'm probably not going to get to have too many decimal places on this. I'd like to have at least four, but I don't think I'm going to be able to see that many on this calculator. Um, so remember zeros in the middle. Uh, the test statistics over here to the left, 2.9790. We find the area to the left because it's a left tail test. And so this will be TCDF. The lower bound is negative infinity. The upper bound is negative 2.9790. And then the degree of freedom, which is 34. And that's going to give me my p-value. So let me do that calculation here. Menu. Statistics, distribution, sorry, I have to talk myself through the process. TCDF, lower bound is negative, I'm just gonna do nines. The upper bound is negative 2.9790, whoops, 2.9790. And the degree of freedom was 34. And I'm getting just, again, I'm only going to get two. Uh, oh, no, this is this could be bad, actually. Um, let's see. Uh, well, wait a minute. It seems to not like what I typed in here. So, OK, sorry. I had to, I had to hit Enter. Um, so I get three decimal places, but that's not too helpful. It's 0 0.002 something. Uh, there's more to it than that, but hopefully if you're following along with your calculator while you're watching the video, hopefully you're using a TI-84 and you're going to see the rest of those numbers. But the first, our first three decimal places should match. So you should have something that also starts with 0 0.002, but then you'll probably have some more information after that. All right. And so that's our p-value. We don't need to double this because it is um, not a two-tail test. All right. So that's step five. Step six is to decide whether you should reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis, All right? And so we can use the critical value to make that decision. Our critical value is around negative 2.4. That's where we're drawing the line. The test statistic crosses that line further into the left tail, which means we will reject the null hypothesis. So that would be the conclusion based on the critical value. If you want to use the p-value, you compare that to alpha, 
p-value is 0 0.002, alpha is 0 0.01. And even though this number got cut off and there's more to it, it's still pretty clear that the p-value is less than alpha. And in that case, you would decide to reject the null hypothesis as well. And so we reject the null hypothesis. So now we want to state our final conclusion about the claim. So this is the last step, step seven. So I'll go ahead and uh, type this out like I've been doing lately instead of writing it out. So remember, when you reject the null hypothesis, you've, you've come to a conclusion. You, you're definitely going to support something with evidence. So our conclusion, our final conclusion should start off with, there is sufficient evidence. Right? So if you reject the null hypothesis, you have sufficient evidence for something. But you have to decide, is it sufficient evidence to support a claim or to reject a claim? We're rejecting the null hypothesis, but in this problem, our um, you know, null hypothesis was not the claim. Our claim did not become the null hypothesis in this problem. So when I reject the null hypothesis, I'm not really, um, that doesn't apply to the claim itself. Let's put it that way. Our claim became the alternative hypothesis. So by rejecting the null hypothesis, we are accepting the alternative as true. Our claim is that alternative hypothesis. So we are accepting the claim as true as well. So anything I say about the alternative hypothesis in this problem, I'm saying about the claim itself. I'm accepting the alternative, which means I'm accepting the claim. All right, so there's sufficient evidence to support the claim that, and it's a good idea to try to use the wording that was given for the claim in the original problem. I have struggled with this myself, like in class, I always forget, and I don't want to go look because I'm being lazy, but I believe it says something like that blue enhances creativity. Um, maybe there was a little bit more to it than that. Maybe it says something like, you know, blue backgrounds enhance creativity. Right. Instead of saying we support the claim that the mean of the first group is less than the mean of this, you know, that, that still wouldn't really mean anything to anybody and using, you know, referring to the mean and whatnot, you know, again, it's kind of technical language, which sometimes is okay. Again, it depends on how the claim was initially stated, but to put it in more plain language, that's easier to understand. This would be a better way to do that. And it doesn't refer to the mean necessarily or anything like that. It's just, we use the mean to make this determination, but the determination we made was that, people and you know subjects in a blue background are better able to think creatively than subjects with a red background all right and so that is the final answer to that problem so that is the hypothesis testing part of the problem we are also going to be asked to find the confidence interval for the same uh, set of data so using the data from this color creativity example construct a 98% confidence interval estimate for the difference between the mean creativity score for those with a red background and the mean creativity score for those with a blue background. So notice here, they have also made that decision for the red group to be group number one and the, the blue group to be group number two, right? Because we want to, we're trying to estimate the difference between the red group and the blue group. So the red group's going first, that's mu one, minus the blue group is going second, that's mu two. Um, so, so I guess maybe it was a good thing that we decided to go that direction, even though I think it made figuring out the claim more difficult, it's matching the rest of the problem a little bit better, All right? Um, so the formula for finding the confidence interval is mu one minus mu two, right? That's the thing we're estimating to get the lower estimate. We'll take the sample version of that. So we'll take the difference in the sample means minus a margin of error. To get the upper estimate, we'll take the sample version, the difference in the means for the samples, plus a margin of error. And again, we already have the sample data, right? Uh, we have, I feel like I should be able to remember it, but I don't. So let's go back to this chart. 3.39 for the mean of the first group, minus 3. Point, oh, I already forgot it, 3.97 for the mean of the second group. All right, 
So that's the difference in the sample means, minus a margin of error, which we don't currently have. So we're going to have to go calculate that. On this side, it'll be the same thing, the two sample means. 3.39 minus 3.97 plus a margin of error, which we currently don't have. All right, so we have to take a break from this calculation, right? We have to put that on pause, uh, take a time out, however you want to say that. And we need to go find the margin of error, which is given by this formula here. T sub alpha divided by 2 times the square root of S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over N2. Um, now, the stuff in the square root is on that chart. It's on that table we were given. So we don't have to do any calculations. Those numbers are just given to us. The critical value, now we talked about this in 9.1. And while this problem actually states what the confidence level should be, not most of the problems won't. I was going to say not all problems do, but I want to say most of them don't. And they will say instead to construct an appropriate confidence interval, meaning you choose the appropriate confidence level for the confidence interval so that it's comparable to the hypothesis test that you just did. And the way we make sure it's comparable is that we make sure the critical value stays the same for the confidence interval as what we had for the hypothesis testing. I don't know, the, the grammar there, I don't know if I said that in the best way, but whatever the critical value was from the hypothesis test, we need to use the same critical value for the confidence interval. I think that's a better way to say that. All right, so what was the critical value for the hypothesis test? You know, again, I wish I had the number more accurately than this, but it was negative 2.4, right? This was the critical value. Um, so I don't know, what do I wanna do here? Um, so this is what I wanna use. I'm trying to think of how to mark this. <laughs> I just put another box around it, but with a different color. This was the critical value from the hypothesis test. I want the same critical value for the confidence interval. So over here, I want this to also be 2.4. Now here it's negative because it's a left tail test, but for confidence intervals, we always make the critical value positive. So we're just gonna drop the negative sign, but we want, we want to keep the same number. So 2.4 is the number that we want, but let's just drop the negative sign. So that's the critical value that you should be using to construct this confidence interval. Now, to make that happen, we need the area in the left tail to be 0 0.01, just like it was here, right? The area is 0 0.01. That's what gives me this critical value of 2.4. So I want the same area for the confidence interval. The problem, however, is that if you have this area in the left tail for confidence intervals, you have to match the area in the right tail as well. So for hypothesis testing, you don't have to do that. So it was a left tail test. All the alpha goes into the left tail and you leave the right tail alone. But for confidence intervals, it's always a two tail situation. And so if we need the area to still be 0.01 to get the same critical value for the left tail, we have to match that area in the right tail when we're doing confidence intervals. So that means I have another 0 0.01 in the right tail now, which means my total area is 0 0.02, which means my confidence level is going to be 98%, which is what the problem said we were supposed to find anyways. But that wasn't, you know, because 98% is kind of a weird one, isn't it, right? If you think back to chapter seven or in 9.1, anytime we've done confidence intervals, we've never had a confidence level of 98%. Why was that chosen this time? Because that was the appropriate confidence level to match the hypothesis test that we just did. All right, so again, we need the left tail to still be 0.01 to get this critical value, but for confidence interval, we need the same area in the right tail. That means we have 0.01 in both tails this time, which actually gives me an alpha of 0.02 for the confidence interval. So for the hypothesis test, alpha is 0.01, but for this confidence interval, it's going to be 0 0.02 to get that matching area. And if that's the area, the confidence level then becomes 98%. All right. So the rest of this is given in the table. I think I remember these for some reason. 0.97 squared over 35. Um, and then 0.63 squared over 36. We plug that into our calculator. Oh, gosh. Okay. Uh, 
I should have took some time to like review how to do this. Um, let me see. Um, uh, is it control? Okay. Oh yeah, that was it. Ah, oh, but I went too far. Okay. Um, let's go back to this. Okay, I figured it out. Yeah, so again, I'll show you real quick so you can see what I'm struggling with here. Um, so the TI Inspire has tabs on across the top, and the different there's different kinds of tabs for different um, activities. So if you want to do statistics, you need a spreadsheet tab. If you want to do two plus two equals four, you need a calculation tab. And I maybe I could do two plus two equals four on the spreadsheet as well, but I don't know. So. But then actually switching between the tabs is not that intuitive. It's, you know, you have to kind of know the, the trick to do that. And I've forgotten it, but I just figured it out. So anyways, sorry for the distraction. So I'm gonna plug this into my calculator, 2.4, if, if I can, let's see, okay. Uh, 2.4, all right, times the square root of 0.97 squared, divided by 35 plus 0.63 squared divided by 36. All right, it looks like it did the right thing. And so I'm getting a margin of error of 0 0.467, I don't wanna to go too many decimal places here, three, I guess I'll just go four decimal places like I usually do. So E is equal to this, all right. So there's our margin of error. Now that we have the margin of error, we can find our confidence interval. So we're gonna have 0 0.046, uh, I think I'll just stop at three decimal places here because the mean only goes two decimal places. It's probably a good idea just to go three with our margin of error. I'm sorry, that was a weird four. Four, six, seven. Do the same thing here, 0.467. So let's type this into our calculator now. So we have 3.39 minus 3.97 minus the margin of error, 0.467, which is gonna give me negative 1.047. Right. That'd be my lower estimate. My upper estimate would be 3.39 minus 3.97 plus the margin of error, 0.467 and I get negative 0 0.113. All right, and so that would be my confidence interval, my 98% confidence interval, which might not be exactly right because again, my critical value was pretty severely limited since I could only round it to one decimal place because of my uh, limitations on my calculator. So I, if we had a couple more decimal places here, this might be, these numbers might be slightly different. Okay, now the thing you want to notice, and we talked about this a little more at length in the previous video for section 9.1, that if this one's negative and this one's negative, you can draw a definitive conclusion here. The only way that this difference would be negative is that the first number, mu1, would have to be smaller than the second number. And we know, based on our estimate here, we're 98% confident that this difference is negative, right? Because our estimate the range of our estimates only contain negative values. So every number we're estimating for that difference is a negative number. And so we're, we can be pretty confident that the difference is negative. And if that's the case, the first number has to be smaller than the second number, which just reinforces the conclusion that we just drew from the hypothesis testing. All right, so let's take a look at another example. Words are displayed on a computer screen with background colors of red or blue. <clears throat> Excuse me. The results from scores on a test of word recall are given on the next page. Use a 0.05 significance level to test the claim that the sample are from populations with the same mean. So I'm sorry about that typo there. Um, let's try that again. Okay, populations with the same mean. First, we'll test the claim using a hypothesis test then we will test the claim by constructing an appropriate confidence interval. So this time they don't tell us the confidence level, but we just went over how to determine that in the last example, and we will do the same on this one. All right, so let's take a look at this data. 
All right, for the red background, I was going to say, is this the same information we were just doing? Maybe it's the same group of people. I don't know. 35 people had a red background. That's how many were in the last problem with red backgrounds. But what is different is the sample mean here is 15.89. I guess that's the average number of words they were able to recall. And the standard deviation was 5.90. Uh, for a blue background, the sample size was again 36. But here the sample mean is 12.31. That's the average number of words they were able to recall. And S is 5.48, the standard deviation. Now, again, given the order that these are presented in, we'll just go ahead and stick with that order as far as numbering goes. So we'll have the red background group be population number one. So this will be N1, X1 bar, S1. And we'll let the blue group be population number two. So this will be N2, X2 bar, and S2. All right. And so let's go ahead and get this process started. So step one, what is the claim? Now this one, it was a little bit more literal. The claim was that the means would be equal, that the average word recall from both groups would be the same, right? I can't remember the exact wording that they use, but um, test the claim that the samples, again, I, I did a bad job with the grammar here. Test the claim that the samples are from populations with the same mean. Okay. So same means equal. So the claim is that the population mean of people with red backgrounds is equal to this population mean of people with blue backgrounds, right? So the average number of words recalled for people that are reading the words from a red background will be the same as the average number of words recalled from people reading the words from a blue background, which is a very, very wordy claim, but that's boils down to the mean from population one should equal the mean from population two. Not should, but that's the claim that's being made, right? Now, step two, hypotheses, got the null, got the alternative. The claim has to become one of these. The null has to contain equality, which means since the claim has equality, the claim will become the null hypothesis. So mu one equals mu two, that'd be our null hypothesis. And then the alternative would have to be the opposite of that. So the opposite of equals to is not equals to. Right. And this time we don't have to simplify because it is already simplified. So this would be the answer for the null and the alternative hypothesis. Step three, identify alpha, which I have already forgotten. So let's go back to this. 0.05, right, it's given in the problem. So alpha is equal to 0.05. And whether it's a left tail, right tail, or two tail test, not equals two means this is a two tail test this time. All right. Uh, test statistic, we'll use this formula here. X one bar minus X two bar minus mu one minus mu two over the square root of S one squared over N one plus S two squared over N two and all the numbers are provided to us up here, except for the population mean. Those numbers, actually the numbers aren't provided, but the computation is resolved by the null hypothesis. We're going to assume that the null hypothesis is true. And if mu1 indeed does equal mu2, if we assume that's true, then when you subtract them, you'll just get zero. And that happens every time, All right? And oh, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to keep all the numbers here. I guess if I do this, this will work um, <clears throat> almost. Okay, so X1 bar is 15.89 minus, <clears throat> excuse me, X2 bar, which is 12.31, <clears throat> excuse me, minus zero, right? Because that goes to zero, which I'm going to write on the paper again for emphasis, but in my calculator, I will not, um, sorry about that. I will not type that into my calculator because it'll just get in the way and mess up the calculation that we're trying to do. Uh, I guess if I do this, this will work. Okay. Over the square root of S1, which is 5.90 squared over N1, remember, which was 35, plus, <clears throat> there goes my voice again, 
S2, which is 5.48 squared over N2, which is 36. All right, so there is my test statistic. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't know what's going on. Okay, and so I'm going to plug that into my calculator. And so parentheses, 15.89 minus 12.31. Close the parentheses. I'm not typing in the zero, so I just go to divided by the square root of 5.90 squared over 35 plus 5.48 squared over 36. And enter. And I get 2.64. Seven three. You might say, how are you getting so many decimal places this time? Because again, there's different uh, tabs. There's different menu. Uh, how do you say? It? There's different screen types. Maybe that's a good way to say it. So on my, this is my calculation screen, and it shows a few more decimal. Not a lot actually, but it shows a few more. Um, so this is not on a spreadsheet. So when I do statistics, that has to be done on the spreadsheet. And I think it does. I don't know. I've never really tried to do it. Well, I guess I could do it here, actually. So that actually would work. Okay. So I didn't realize, actually, I'm not going to show you. There's a long menu here. And there's statistics that can be done on this menu. But I assume if it involves a list, like if I want to do one of our stats, I probably have to be in the spreadsheet uh, menu. Or I keep saying menu. I have to be on the spreadsheet screen. Um, but it looks like I can do maybe normal CDF, that kind of stuff on the calculation screen. So I'm going to give that a try and maybe I'll be able to have a few more decimal places this time. Anyways, I'm sorry for all the tangential talk. Let me try to get focused again. All right. Step five is to find um, the critical value and the p-value. Now in this case, there's actually going to be two critical values. So let's go ahead and make that plural. Um, because it's a two-tailed test, right? So because it's a two-tailed test, we want to take alpha and divide it by two because we have to cover both tails this time. So that one alpha has to be used to cover both the left and the right tail. So we'll put half of it in the left tail, half of it in the right tail. And so that gives me 0 0.025. That's the amount of area that will go into each tail. So the total area is still 0 0.05, but half of it's over here in the left tail, 0 0.025. Half of it's in the right tail, 0 0.025. All right. And so we want to find the critical value. We'll use uh, inverse T. The area is 0 0.025. And then we need the degree of freedom, which is going to be the same in this problem as it was in the last problem because we have the same exact sample sizes for both of our samples. But let's just go through the exercise one more time. All right. So n is equal to 35, that means my degree of freedom here is 34. I'm just going to, it's n minus 1, I'm just going to skip it. It's one less than the sample size, right? Here, my degree of freedom will be 35. Right? It's one less than the sample size. So this is for population number 1, this is for population number 2. For my hypothesis testing, I want the smaller of the two. So my degree of freedom for the hypothesis testing will be 34. Um, so we want the smaller of the two here. And that's what I'll use for my calculations down here. So the degree of freedom will be 34 again. And right, I'm sorry, I didn't really leave myself enough room. Um, and so what are we going to end up getting here? So let me try this calculation on this screen and see if we can get more decimal places out of it. Um, statistics. Uh, okay, the menu's different here. Oh, but distribution's still on here, so that's good. And then, yeah, so we can still do inverse T, it looks like. Okay, so the area, 0 0.025. And degree of freedom is 34. And so we're going to get negative. And I do get a couple more decimal places, which is nice. 0, 3, 2. I'll just, well, let me go four decimal places. 0, 3, 2, 2. 
Right. Now that's the critical value for the left tail that corresponds to that area, but there's also a critical value for the right tail that corresponds to 0.025 being the area to the right. But because of the symmetry, because zero is in the middle, these numbers will be exactly the same. It's just one's negative, one's positive. So my other critical value will be the same number, but positive. And so these are my two critical values in this case. Right. For p-value, um, we take the test statistic, which is 2.6473. And we find the area in this case to the closest tail. Because it's a two-tail test, you just move, you find the area, I'm going to say you move, but I don't know if that's really the right way to describe it. You want the area to the tail that's closest to your test statistic. Um, I don't know if that's really the best way to describe it either, but I think, I don't know, it seems to register with my students. So um, the area, the tail that's closest to my test statistic is the right tail. So maybe another way you could frame it is, what tail is your test statistic moving into? Is it moving into the left tail or is it moving into the right tail? This test statistic is moving into the right tail, so we want the area towards that right tail, right? So we want that area there, which is gonna be TCDF. The lower bound here is 2.6473. The upper bound is infinity, and then we need a degree of freedom, which again will be 34. And so let's go ahead and see if I can do that and get a few more decimal places if I do it this way. All right, statistics, distribution, um, TCDF, lower bound is negative 99999. I bet there's a way to do infinity on this calculator, but I'm not gonna bother trying to figure that out right now. Uh, whoops, uh, did I do it? I did it the wrong way, actually. The lower bound's not negative infinity. Let's see, can I go back? Okay, sorry. It's 2.6473. That's the lower bound. The upper bound is 9999999, which again is infinity. And the degree of freedom is 34. Okay. And I get 0, whoops, kind of messed up here, 0 0.006104. Now the reason you might say, how did you mess up? You put zero again, because it's a two-tail test, so I have to multiply this by two. So I wanted to leave room to put that, right? We gotta double that because it's a two-tail test to get the p-value. So I multiply that by two, and I get my p-value as 0 0.0122. Okay, and so that will be the p-value for this problem. So there's the p-value. Now I need to draw my initial conclusion. Do I reject or fail to reject? So this is step six. If I use the critical values to make this decision, we are drawing a line at negative 2.0322 and positive 2.0322. So if my test statistic crosses either of these lines further into the left or the right tail, I will reject the null hypothesis. But if it stays in between the critical values, I would fail to reject. Our test statistic crosses the line. It crosses the right line further into the right tail, right? It's 2.6473. So it ends up crossing the line further into the right tail. So that means I should reject my assumption, reject the null hypothesis. All right, if I use the p-value to make the determination, I compare that to alpha. The p-value is 0 0.0122. Alpha was 0 0.05. The p-value is indeed less than alpha. So again, I would reject the null hypothesis. All right. So now we need to state our final conclusion about the claim itself. So let's go ahead and type that in here. All right. Um, this time, now in the last problem, we also rejected the null hypothesis. So again, whenever you're rejecting, there is sufficient evidence for something. There is sufficient evidence to, now we have to decide, are we supporting the claim or are we rejecting the claim? In this case, so in the last problem, we rejected the null hypothesis, which led us to conclude that we are supporting the claim that was being made. But in this problem, we are going to conclude that we are rejecting the claim that's being made because our claim is the null hypothesis. 
So whatever I say about the null hypothesis, I'm also saying about the claim. If I reject the null, I'm rejecting the claim too. There is sufficient evidence to warrant rejection of the claim that the mean number of words recalled for both groups is the same. So I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that's essentially what it was saying. All right. So again, let's double check that so you can understand why that would be the proper conclusion here. So if we go back up here at the beginning, right, the claim that's being made becomes the null hypothesis. So any conclusion I draw about the null hypothesis applies to the claim as well. If I reject the null, I reject the claim. If I fail to reject the null, I fail to reject the claim, right? And that's the only two things we're going to be able to say about it in this case. Now, in the previous problem, if we go back to that, the claim became the alternative hypothesis. So when I decided to reject the null, that doesn't address the claim, right? The null was not the claim. The alternative was the claim. By rejecting the null, we are accepting the alternative as true. And so whatever I say about the alternative, I'm saying about the claim in this case, right? Because the claim is the alternative hypothesis. So if I'm accepting the alternative as true, then I'm accepting the claim as true. If I failed to reject the null, I'd be failing to accept the alternative, which means the other possible conclusion here would be to fail to show that the claim was true, right? Um, so that'd be the only two conclusions you could draw in this case is either we're going to show this is true or fail to show that it's true. Right. So that's how that works. Okay. Um, we were also asked to find the confidence interval in this case. So let me, let's make a new page for that because it's already too cluttered on that page. All right. Same formula as the first example. We have x1 bar minus x2 bar minus the margin of error. That's the lower estimate. The thing we're estimating goes in the middle x1 bar minus x2 bar plus the margin of error gives us our upper estimate. We already have these numbers here, right? x1 bar is 15.89, I believe. Is that what I had here? Yes. Minus x2 bar is 12.31. But then I need to calculate the margin of error before I can go any further with that calculation. And the same thing's gonna happen over here. 15.89 minus 12.31 plus the margin of error. All right, um, so we need the margin of error. So let's take a moment to go find that. So we're gonna stop what we're doing here, create a new space over here for finding the margin of error. The formula for that is T sub alpha divided by two times the square root of S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over N2. Now, um, these numbers we were given. So let's just go ahead and plug those in. All right. I don't remember what they were. I think I remember the first one, actually. It's, it's, it's still in my calculator, actually. I can still see it here. So S1 was 5.90. I happen to remember that one for some reason. But let me just double check. Yeah. Over N1, which is 35, plus S2 squared. That's going to be 5.48 squared over N2, which is 32. We're going to take the square root of that. And the critical value. We haven't calculated yet, but we have actually. We just haven't calculated it on this screen, but we want this critical value to be the exact same critical value that we had from our um, hypothesis testing. So if we go back to our hypothesis testing, locate the critical value from this process, we want the same critical value for the confidence interval as well. So this is the critical value I want here. Now we had two critical values, one negative, one positive, but remember for margin of error, you always drop the negative sign anyways. You just care about what that number is. And the number is 2.0322. That will be our critical value for the confidence interval, 2.0322. We want the same critical value here. Now in order for that to be the critical value, the area that we would need is 0 0.025, right? That's the area that we had here, we want the same area in the left tail here so that we end up getting the same critical value again. So I don't need to redo that calculation. I've already done it. 
I did the calculation for the hypothesis testing, it's going to be the same result here. But if that's the area that I want in my left tail, I need to match that area in the right tail, but it already was matched, right? I mean, we already, this was a two tail test. We already had that area in both tails and we're just gonna keep it the same for the confidence interval because the confidence interval needs that area in both tails as well. And so the total area in both tails is 0 0.05, right? So this is, you know, when it's a two tail test for the hypothesis testing, the value of alpha will stay the same for the confidence interval because the confidence interval is also a two tail test. The only time a change occurs is when we're going from a one tail test for the hypothesis testing to the two tail confidence interval because that's always two tail when you're doing a confidence interval, right? And that's when alpha is going to change values. But if it's already a two tail test for hypothesis testing, that's exactly what you want for the confidence interval as well. So the value of alpha actually will end up staying the same. And so my confidence level here is going to be 95%. Right, so that alpha means that's going to be my confidence level. I'm not sure if my stat lab is going to ask you what is your confidence level for this confidence interval, but that's how you would figure it out. If it doesn't ask you, then you don't even really have to worry about it. You could just ignore this and just remember the critical value is from hypothesis testing. So go grab that number, plug it in here for the margin of error, and you don't have to even think about alpha, really, because you just want to make sure this critical value is the same. It doesn't matter what alpha is. This, this number is what's important, right? But if so it doesn't matter what alpha is for finding the margin of error here because you just want to use the same critical value that you had from the hypothesis testing. But the alpha does matter if you're trying to find the confidence level. Then you have to think about what that means, right? And that's how you get the confidence level. All right, anyways, margin of error. Let's plug this in. So we have 2.0322 times the square root of 5.9 squared over 35 plus... 5.48 squared over 36. Enter, and I get a margin of error of 2.7. We have two decimal places here, so I'm going to carry this to three decimal places. 2.748. So there's our margin of error. Now that we have the margin of error, we can actually find our confidence interval. All right, so we'll have uh, 2.748 here and 2.748 here. And that'll give us our lower and our upper estimate. So I have 15.89 minus 12.31 minus that margin of error, 2.748. And I end up getting 0 0.832. I think that's right, okay. And then for the upper estimate, it's 15.89 minus 12.31 plus the margin of error, 2.748. And I get 6.328, which maybe we're supposed to round these to like just two decimal places since that's what we started off with. And if we do that, this is what we end up getting, 6.33. Okay, so I don't know. My stat lab should tell you where to round these off to. So that's our 95% confidence interval estimate. It's the appropriate confidence level so that the result we're getting here should be compatible with what we did in part A with the hypothesis testing. And our conclusion really is the same. So because these are both positive, that tells me, so all of the estimated values I have for this difference are positive. And the only way that difference would be positive is if the first number, mu1, is bigger than the second number, mu2. So when I subtract them, the answer comes out positive, which is what I'm expecting based on my estimate. And so this would be my conclusion in this case, right? Which means they're not equal, right? I, I'm not expecting these to be equal. I'm expecting the first mean to be bigger than the second mean, right? That's what my confidence interval is telling me. All right, we have one more example to look at and then we'll be done. Okay, last example. Listed on the next screen are the numbers of years that popes and British monarchs since 1690 lived after their election or coronation. Treat the values as simple random samples from a larger population. Use a 0.01 significance level to test the claim that the mean longevity for popes is less than the mean for British monarchs after coronation. All right, so let's take a look 
at our data set. Um, so I'm sorry, this is kind of weird formatting. So this, uh, the, don't forget this 15 is part of the Monarch set, but it kind of got separated from the rest of the numbers. Um, so we have the years that popes got to be popes and kings and queens got to be kings and queens, right? So this first number is two. So that pope only lived for two years after becoming pope. Um, and then pretty sure, I guess that's not necessarily true. I think popes can retire. That has happened, but I'm assuming that they died. And so that's what brought their, um, uh, how do you say, their time in office to an end, right? Uh, so nine years, 21 years, three years. So that's what this data represents. We want to test this claim using a hypothesis test and also by constructing a confidence interval of the appropriate confidence level. The major difference with this problem is that we are not given the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. We saw this happen sometimes in 8.3 when we were testing claims about just one population mean that sometimes they would give us the sample mean, other times they would just give us the sample. And then we had to compute the sample mean for ourselves. So again, I'll just stick with the same order that the information is presented in. We will let the popes be population number one, and we'll let the monarchs be population number two. But what I need from this is the sample size of this first sample from the popes, and the sample mean, and the sample standard deviation in order to be able to test this, this claim. Same thing with the monarchs. I need to know the sample size. I need to know the mean. And I need to know, let's try that one more time. I need to know the standard deviation. All right. All of that can be found using one of our stats. Now, sometimes when you present students with this task, they'll say, oh, the mean, I can do that. Two plus nine plus 21. Yes, you could do that. And it's not too difficult of a task. Even with all these numbers, it wouldn't take too long. But what about the standard deviation, right? You're not going to want to do that by hand. You want your calculator to get that number for you. If you're going to have to use your calculator to get the standard deviation, you might as well let it do the sample mean for you as well. So what I'm going to do, because it might take me a little while to get, figure out how I want to use my TI Inspire to, you know, get the information we need. I'm going to pause the recording and feel free for you. You could do the same. I don't know. I always have trouble like transitioning here, but you can pause the, the viewing of the video and also practice typing the data sets into your calculator using list and then doing the one var stats just to make sure you remember how to do that. So that's what you would do on the TI-84. I'm going to do the same thing on my TI-Inspire. We should come up with the same results. So I'm going to pause the recording. You could pause the playing of the video and, and try this out for yourself and make sure you're able to do it as well. Okay, so what I come up with is that for the first sample, the sample size is 24, which isn't really obvious when you look at that sample, but the one of our stats tells me that. Uh, the mean of that sample is 13.1, going one more decimal place than what's present in the original data. And the standard deviation is 9.0. It was really like 8.97 something, but when you round it to one decimal place, you get 9.0. For the monarchs, the sample size is 14, the sample mean is 22.7, and the standard deviation for that sample is 18.6. All right, so let's um, do the hypothesis testing. We'll just do that on this screen, and then we'll create a new screen for the confidence interval. Uh, so the first thing is we want to test the claim, or not test the claim. We, we are testing the claim, but the first thing we want to do is state the claim, um, which was on the previous screen. I already forgot what it was. The mean longevity for popes is less than for monarchs, All right? So again, popes is um, population number one. Uh, and we think that mean for population number one is less than the mean for monarchs, which is population number two. All right, so that is our claim in mathematical form. Uh, the hypotheses, we have the null and the alternative hypothesis. The claim has to become one of these. The null has to contain equality. There is no equality in this claim, which means the claim must then become the alternative hypothesis. Mu1 is less than mu2. The null has to be the opposite of that, which would be greater than or equal to. And then we will simplify the null to just equals two. So we'll have mu1 equals mu2, and the alternative will just stay as is. Mu1 is less than mu2. And these would be 
our hypotheses for this hypothesis test. Three, we will find alpha, which I believe was 0 0.01, but I might go back and check that at some point. And the tail we're doing here is a left tail test, because again, we have left than, less than, which makes it a left tail test. All right. Step four, test statistic. Uh, I'll see if I can, I don't know, these are kind of spread out here. Uh, I was going to try to have the formula and the numbers in one place, but it doesn't seem like that's going to work out. So I'll just do the work right here. This is for the test statistic. Here's the formula one more time. X1 bar minus X2 bar minus mu1 minus mu2 over the square root of S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared over N2. Um, again, we will assume that the null hypothesis is true. And if mu1 indeed does equal mu2, if we're assuming that there, again, we don't have evidence for that, but we're going to assume that's true. And if that is true, then when I subtract those, I'll get zero. Right, so I'll go to zero again. Uh, the rest of these numbers, uh, maybe, I don't know. I don't have them in my calculator, so I switched to the other screen, so I can't see my numbers anymore. Um, uh, what was that? I don't, I really honestly don't remember. Okay, uh, I have such a bad memory. 13.1 um, for the sample mean of the Popes minus 13, not 13, what am I saying? X2, X bar 2, which is 22.7. 22.7. Minus zero, which again, I'm not going to actually type into my calculator, but just to emphasize that we acknowledge that, we processed it, and that's what we ended up getting. Um, over S1 squared, so S1 was 9.0. I should have remembered that. I talked about it earlier. 9.0 squared over N1, which was 24. I think I do remember finally one of these numbers. Over, I remember this one was 14, but I don't remember the standard deviation. 18.6. Yeah, that wasn't even, I would have never figured that out if I, my memory had already expunged that information. So, okay. So all the numbers are plugged into our formula. So now we're ready to calculate. So we'll plug this into our calculator. We have parentheses for the numerator, 13.1 minus 22.7, close the parentheses, divided by this, don't type in the zero, so I'm skipping that part, divided by the square root of nine, nine point zero is just nine, so nine squared divided by 24, plus 18.6 squared divided by 14. And I get a test statistic of negative 1.8114, if I go four decimal places. All right, so there's our test statistic. Not quite as extreme as the ones we've had so far today, right, in this video. Okay, so step five, critical value and p-value. So for the critical value, we take alpha. This time we only have to cover the left tail because it's a left tail test. So I don't need to divide this in two. All of the alpha just goes right into the left tail. So 0 0.01 in the left tail. I want to find the T value that corresponds to that area. So this will be inverse T. The area to the left is 0 0.01. And then I need degree of freedom. Now this time it's going to be different than the last two problems. So I guess let's go back up here to do that calculation like we've done in the previous two examples. The degree of freedom for group number one would be 23, right? It's so one less than the sample size. The degree of freedom for group number two is going to be 13. So for my hypothesis testing, the degree of freedom I will use is the smaller of the two. It'll be 13. I'm going to use the smaller one. All right. So I'm going to use degree of freedom 13 for these calculations. All right. So 13 for the degree of freedom. Type this into my calculator. We have to go to menu. Sorry, if you have a TI-84, again, it's a different process. But for me, it's menu, statistics, distribution, and then inverse T, and then area, 0.01, and 
and degree of freedom 13. And I get negative, I guess I'll put it here, negative 2.6503. All right, and that's it. There's only one critical value this time because it's just a left tail test. We have one critical value in the left tail. For the p-value, uh, we will take the test statistic. Zero's in the middle. The test statistic's negative, so it will venture into the left tail. For this scenario, we want to find the area to the left, not because it's closer or in the left tail, but because it's a left tail test, that means we should find the area to the left. No matter where that test statistic's located, left tail, you always want to find the area to the left. So we're going to use TCDF to do that. Um, the lower bound is going to be negative infinity this time. The upper bound is negative one point. Oh, I skipped a number. Negative 1.8114, the degree of freedom is 13, and that's going to give us our p-value. So again, I have to talk myself through this. Menu, statistics, distribution, TCDF, lower bound, negative 999999, this time for sure. Um, upper bound is negative 1.8114. And the degree of freedom is 13. And I get for my p-value 0 0.04, uh, I guess let's go four decimal places, 66. Six. I don't need to multiply this p-value by 2 because it was not a two-tail test. It was just a left-tail test. So the area I get here is the p-value that I'm looking for. Oh, let's just write that one more time. Okay, p-value. There we go. All right, so that's step five. Step six, I guess, uh, usually I do that down here, but let's just do it over here. We have some space over here. We either reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So if we use the critical value to make this determination, the cutoff value, which is the critical value, is negative 2.6503. If the test statistic crosses that line further into the left tail, we should reject the null hypothesis, but it doesn't. It stays to the right of that. So our critical value is negative, not our critical value, sorry. Our test statistic is negative 1.8114. It doesn't cross that line. It stays on the safe side of it. And so we will fail to reject the null hypothesis this time. So this is the safe zone over here. This is the zone of concern. I don't know a good name for it, but if you cross that line, you need to be concerned about the assumption, which means the null hypothesis. So we reject the null hypothesis if it crosses that line. So this is the, the danger zone. This is the safe zone over here. And the test statistic stayed in the safe zone. So we don't need to throw out the assumption. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Um, all right p-value method, if you wanted to use that instead, we compare the p-value to alpha. Alpha was 0.01 in this case. I never went back to check, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. And if it wasn't, it's too late now. I'm just going to stick with alpha being 0.01. Now you can't do that on the test, right? Whatever alpha is given to you, you have to use that alpha, but I'm the teacher. So if it ends up that alpha wasn't equal to that, it's okay. I'm going to call an audible. All right. So p-value was 0.0466. Um, so the p-value in this case is actually greater than alpha, and in that case, you fail to reject the null hypothesis, right? Now, the interesting thing is if I'm wrong and the alpha actually was supposed to be 0.05, we would get a different conclusion here, right? So the alpha really makes a difference in how this problem ends. If alpha is 0.05, then the p-value is less than alpha, and I would reject the null hypothesis. But if it's 0.01, p-value is greater than that, we fail to reject. So alpha does have some impact on, you know, how we, you know, uh, regard the, the hypotheses, All right? So the last step, step seven, state the claim. But remember, the lower the alpha is, the stronger the conclusion is. So even if alpha was 0.05 and we would reject the null hypothesis in that case, it's kind of a weak conclusion because that's a pretty large value for alpha. 
if we reject the null hypothesis with alpha equal to 0 0.01, that's a stronger conclusion because we had a higher bar that we set and we still failed to reject. Sorry, I say fail to reject. I'm sorry if I'm saying the wrong thing. We set a higher bar with 0 0.01. So if we reject the null hypothesis and alpha is equal to 0 0.01, that's a stronger conclusion because it was a higher bar. It was a higher standard to meet and it still got rejected. So it would be more impactful. And if alpha was equal to 0 0.0001 and you still reject the null hypothesis with that high of a standard, it's an even more impressive result, right? So the smaller alpha is, the more impressive, the stronger the conclusion is, the more confident we can be in that conclusion. So an alpha of 0.05 is kind of weak. And that's why there's a difference here, right? If alpha was 0.05, we'd be rejecting the null hypothesis and we would be supporting the claim this time. But with alpha 0.01, which is a, a, a stronger standard, a higher bar to me, a higher, I don't know how to say it, you know, it's a higher standard, a, a stronger bar. I don't know if that makes sense either, but um, a higher bar, higher standard, I guess both of them should be described that way. Um, it doesn't hold up that well, right? So by setting alpha equal to 0.01, we raise the standard on the threshold that we need to meet in order to draw that conclusion. And this situation doesn't meet that higher threshold. So we have to fail to reject in this case. All right. Anyways, we're almost done. So I should just stay on task. Final conclusion. Now remember, in the last two examples, we rejected the null hypothesis. And so we were able to draw a firm conclusion because of that. There was going to be evidence to do something. But by failing to reject the null hypothesis, it's the opposite case we are not going to have evidence to do anything here, right? It's the inconclusive result. So we want to start off by saying there is not sufficient evidence to do anything here, but we have to decide what it is we were trying to do, right? Is there not sufficient evidence to reject the claim or is there not sufficient evidence to support the claim? Which one is it, right? So again, by failing to reject the null, we are failing to accept the alternative hypothesis. So what matters is which one was the claim? Was the claim the null hypothesis or was it the alternative? Um, in this case, it was the alternative hypothesis. So whatever we say about the alternative is what we say about the claim as well. By failing to reject the null, we fail to support the alternative hypothesis, which means we are failing to support the claim itself. So there is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that the mean longevity, couldn't remember the word they use there, of popes is less than that of British monarchs. I don't know. If I'm not going to capitalize popes, I probably shouldn't capitalize monarchs either. Okay. And so that would be our final conclusion about the claim. One more task, which is to um, do a confidence interval. So let's see. Um, okay, well, I have one more page here. Uh, inferences. I'm, I don't know. I need to take a look at what that's about. But let's insert a page here to do the confidence uh, interval. Okay. So for the same data set, we want to do a confidence interval. So we have x1 bar minus x2 bar minus the margin of error gives us our lower estimate. Mu1 minus mu2, the thing we're estimating, goes in the middle x1 bar minus x2 bar plus the margin of error gives us our upper estimate. So the mean, I can't remember numbers very well. You guys probably remember you're watching the video and you probably remember what these numbers are. 13.1 and 22.7. That's what's coming to mind, but I'm going to have to double check because I'm not confident in that. All right. Um, so, okay. Yeah, I was right. Okay. 13.1, 22.7. 9 and 18.6. Let's see if I can remember those. All right. So minus a margin of error, which we don't know yet. So we're going to have to wait on finishing that calculation. Same thing on the right-hand side. We have 13.1 minus 22.7. Those are the sample means plus a margin of error, which we still need to calculate. So let's do that over here. Uh, maybe I should slide over a little bit further. All right. The margin of error is t sub alpha divided by 2 times the square root of s1 squared over n1 
plus s2 squared over n2. Um, we know these numbers already, 9 for s1 and 18.6, I think it was, for s2. n1 was 24, n2 was 14, pretty sure that's right. And then our critical value that we want to use here, we haven't made any assertions as to what the confidence level is yet. I don't like to determine that until I get to this point of the problem. What I remember about the critical value is I want it to be the same number that was the critical value from the hypothesis testing. And I just drop the negative sign. So if it happened to be negative in the hypothesis testing, that's fine. I want the number. I don't care about the sign of the number, right? So going back to our hypothesis testing, the critical value we found was negative 2.6503. That's the critical value I want for the confidence interval as well. I'm, not, I'm just going to drop the negative sign and just grab the number itself. That'll be my critical value, 2.6503. Right. So I'm going to use the same critical value that we had from the hypothesis testing. Now, in order for that to be my critical value, the area that has to be in the left tail is 0 0.01. Right. That was the area that was in the left tail here that produced that number. I need that area to stay the same in order to produce the same number for my confidence interval. Right. But the difference here is that while for the hypothesis testing, we only had to cover one tail to do the test, for confidence interval, we always have to cover both tails because we're getting a lower estimate and an upper estimate, we have to be concerned about both tails of the distribution. So if this is the, I still need that to be the area for this to be the critical value, but I have to match that area in the right tail as well. So I'm going to need an area of 0.01 in the right tail, which means my total area in both tails is 0 0.02, which again gives me the weird confidence level of 98%. All right, so we're going to have a confidence level, oh, of 98%. All right. So, so this confidence interval I'm making by keeping that critical value the same is going to be a 98% confidence level. And the reason we're choosing that is so that it's compatible with the hypothesis test that we just did. And the results should be identical. All right. So margin of error, plug this into our calculator. We have 2.6503 times the square root of 9 squared divided by 24 plus 18.6 squared divided by 14. And we get a margin of error, it's pretty big actually, 14.04, if I go two decimal places, which is one more decimal place than what we have in these numbers here. So I think that's a good idea for the margin of error. All right. So 14.05, so let's go ahead and put that over here and we can go ahead and finish this problem. So 14.05 for the margin of error for both of these. All right, and so for the lower estimate, we'll have 13.1 minus 22.7 minus 14.05. And so I'm gonna get negative 23 point, I'm gonna round to one decimal place, negative 23.7. Thing we're estimating goes in the middle. For the upper estimate, we get 13.1 minus 22.7, whoops, plus 14.05, and I get 4.5. So that is my 98% confidence interval estimate. To interpret that, like we talked about in section 9.1, you look at the sign of these numbers, the lower estimate is negative the upper estimate is positive, which means our range of estimates contain both negative and positive values and zero, which means any conclusion is theoretically possible, right? If this difference ends up being one of these negative numbers, then mu one would be less than mu two. But it's also possible that the difference could be positive. That's also part of our estimated values. And if the difference happens to be positive, well, then mu one's bigger than mu two. It's also possible that the difference is zero because that's part of our estimation, right? Um, so zero is one of the numbers in our estimate. And if the difference is zero, then mu one actually equals mu two. 
And because all of these types of numbers are within our range of estimates, any of those conclusions are technically possible. So we can't pick one of them, right? Any of them are possible. So this is the inconclusive case, right? That we can't draw a conclusion about which mean is bigger and which mean is smaller in this situation. All right. So let me take a look at that last screen because I forgot that was on there and decide what I want to say about it. But that's the last example. Let me just pause the recording and then we'll talk about that last screen for just a second and then we'll be done. Okay, so this last slide is about um, the way you should approach testing a claim about two means. Um, and we only really covered one particular scenario, which I think is the most common one. Right. So are this population standard deviations known? We asserted that it would be pretty rare for us to actually know what those are. So the we went with no for all the problems that we did. We don't know the population standard deviations. And that's the more realistic, uh, you know, uh, situation. But if you did, then you would use this as your test statistic slash margin of error formula, right? You would use the actual population standard deviations here instead of S, you would use sigma, right? And you would use the normal distribution instead of the T distribution, right? So just to let you know that if you somehow happen to know what those are, this is the route you'd want to go instead. Can it be shown or can it be assumed, excuse me, that the standard deviations are equal? Even if you don't know what they are necessarily, is it possible that you somehow know that they would be have to be the same? If that's the case, you would want to use the T distribution with pooled standard error, whatever that means. So again, we, I don't think you're going to have to deal with that on the homework or on the test. It's definitely not going to be on the test. I can tell you that for a fact, but I don't think it's on the homework either. But again, just to make you aware that there is some nuance in how you have to approach the situation. And if there is some reason why those are equal, you want to take advantage of that. But it does mean a different path you have to take and some different formulas that you would use. And so we, for all the problems we did, we also assumed no, that the standard deviations for the populations were known, and we don't think that they're equal to each other either. And so this has been what we've done with every problem. And so that's, I think, the only thing you're going to have to do as well. So that's what that last screen is about, just providing some awareness of how things might have been different under a few different scenarios. But they're rare, uncommon scenarios that you're not going to encounter in this course. All right. So that concludes the video on section 9.2. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video for section 10.1.